Okay. Uh, well, hi everyone. Uh, welcome to the fourth session of the workshop on recent directions in machine learning as part of Fox. Uh, so our next speaker is uh, Professor Christopher Manning. He's a professor of computer science and linguistics at Stanford University, uh, where he's also the director of the Stanford AI Lab and a co-director of the Stanford uh, Human-Centered Artificial Intelligence Institute. Uh, Chris is a uh, Chris is uh, an expert and leader uh, in uh, deep learning, natural language processing, and uh, applying various deep learning techniques uh, to natural language processing. Uh, and um, he has developed various uh, approaches in computational linguistics. Uh, and uh, so for, uh, for his work, uh, he has, he's heavily, uh, uh, so he's, He's very distinguished. He's an ACM fellow. He's a AAAI fellow. He's an ACL fellow and a past president of uh, the ACL. Uh, so, and he has co-authored leading textbooks in statistical uh, natural language processing and information retrieval. Um, so it's fantastic to have Chris Manning uh, with us today. So, so yeah, please take it away, Chris. Okay, thanks a lot, Arvind. Then let's see. Okay. okay, so hello, I'm Christopher Manning, and today I want to give you a view of the dramatic progress in natural language processing during the past decade. In that period, there's been a reorientation of the field towards using deep learning, the use of distributed representations, distributional semantics, and artificial neural networks. Get all my position a bit. Um, so the talk I'm going to give isn't a CS theory talk. I try a little bit to orient in a, um, to issues that might be of interest. And I will show one big O complexity result, but rather this is really a perspective on what has happened in recently with machine learning and NLP. Um, I look in a bit more depth in two pieces of work that I've worked on and hope to interest you in some of the issues that are still very open. So let me first try and summarize in one slide how most of natural understanding, natural language understanding used to look from the 1970s until 2013. So if you wanted to understand a sentence, for example, to translate a human language query into SQL, you would assign parts of speech to words, parse the grammatical structure of the sentence with a context-free or quite often higher complexity grammar parser, and then calculate a semantic representation using that parse tree. This was broadly true, regardless of whether you were working with a handwritten grammar or with probabilistic rules, which might have been induced using machine learning methods from data. In all cases, the computation was symbolic representations. And the semantics was a denotational semantics, mapping forms to meanings in a model of the world, pretty much like the kind of denotational semantics they use for programming languages, but done over the less formal and less rigidly structured um, human languages following the pioneering work of Montague in 1973 on the proper treatment of quantification in ordinary English. The 21st century zenith of this work was the so-called semantic parsing approach that was pursued among others by Luke Zettelmoyer and my Stanford colleague, Percy Liang in his PhD dissertation. But there are other approaches to semantics. Another one is, distrib is distributional semantics, which has normally had a fairly marginal position in linguistic and philosophical thinking. The idea of it is that you think that the meaning of a word is the context in which it's used. It's often summed up in the slogan of the British linguist, you shall know a word by the company it keeps, um, J.R. Firth. Um, but it goes back further than that. So in Wittgenstein's later philosophical investigations, he also explores a use theory of meaning. This has turned out to be one of the most successful ideas of modern statistical NLP. So when a word appears in a text, its context is just the words that appear around in a fixed size window. And so for a word type, we collect up many contexts of that word type, and we will use them to build up a representation, a meaning of the word. So the context shown gives you a meaning of sorts for the word banking. 
If you wanted to start doing that, about the first way you might be able to think of doing this is say, well, let's build a very large window-based co-occurrence matrix. And for any particular word type, I'll count how often other words appear in the context of it, which I've done from my mute example here. Of course, if we do that, we'll have an extremely large, extremely sparse matrix. And so that led to the um, first widely known method of um, distributed word representations, which was introduced by Dear Western colleagues in 1990, aimed at information retrieval, and quickly thereafter adopted by my then um, grad, fellow grad student, Hinrich Schutzer, in 1992. And, this went under the slogan of latent semantic indexing or latent semantic analysis. But mathematically, what this involved was exactly um, forming an SVD decomposition of this co-occurrence matrix. So the idea is we took the co-occurrence matrix, we did an SVD um, decomposition. Um, in the full decomposition, if it's rectangular, some parts of it are sort of irrelevant. But then after that, we say, well, we'd like to reduce the dimensionality and generalize. So let's, um, the singular values in the middle diagonal matrix are ordered in size. So if we throw away the smallest ones, we're then left with the best rank K approximation um, to X in terms of least squares objective. So if we do that, we then have these lower dimensional representations of words in the rows. So that's um, the truncated U matrix, or perhaps you might want to still scale in the singular values and use the truncated U sigma. And we can use those as a distributed representation of words meaning. And that was explored for both IR and NLP applications in the 90s. Of course, that was, could still be kind of difficult um, especially with the kind of computers that we had in the 1990s, because it was very expensive to compute the SVD for large matrices. Um, so if you had a vocabulary, you know, there are a lot of words in human languages. So if you had a vocabulary that might be as large as 400,000 words, um, the, doing the SVD in those days, you needed a supercomputer. Um, so that suggests that, well, there's a well-known theoretical result that actually you can do just great um, with random projections. And so subsequently in the 2000s, the widespread use method was just to work with random projections. So this idea had been explored a bit, but it never really become very mainstream. Most of the work was like that first slide I was showing. Um, so for the NLP world, the big bombshell um, that really transformed things into a newer world, even though there'd been earlier work, um, was the release of the word to vec algorithm in 2013 by Tomasz Mikulov and colleagues. Um, so this is a paper that now has 32,000 citations. And they outlined this simple recipe. So um, you have a word vocabulary, you start off by just random initialize, randomly initializing those word vectors, and then you iterate through each position in a huge corpus of text, and you try and predict the surrounding words using a probability distribution that is formed simply from the dot product of the word vectors of the center word and the context words and converted into a probability distribution using this softmax form where you exponentiate and then normalize by the sum of ex uh, all the possible words exponentiated. Um, and then we do um, neural network style learning. So we do stochastic gradient descent learning where we can work out the loss function for the predictions given this probability distribution. And then we can nudge the gradients in a direction away from uh, of downhill in the um, gradient space to sort of make these estimates better estimates. And the amazing thing was doing no more than this, um, this algorithm learns word vectors that just do an amazingly good job at capturing the meaning of words as expressed by word similarity, but also more than that in capturing um, meaning components. And I think it's fair to say that for a lot of people at the time, that seemed like a kind of miracle. I mean, it's basic math that if you're doing this, you have to be improving the probability estimates of predicting words that occur in the context of other words. But it's not at all clear that just um, doing a bit of calculus on gradients is actually going to produce a vector um, for each word that 
in very, very meaningful ways captures their semantics. But that was what was found. So if you take these words and look at the kind of word space um, that results, well, at this distance, you can't see anything. But if you start to zoom in, even despite the limitations of taking a two-dimensional projection of a, say, 300-dimensional space, if you can see for word similarity, it's just grouping similar words very well. So in this bit of the space I've zoomed into, we've got country words at the top, and then we've got um, sort of nationality or adjectival forms down the bottom middle and off to the right we've got words like parliament and elections and they're pretty similar if we zoom to a different part of the space here is where some of the verbs are and it's not even just that we have a tangle of verbs there's a lot of microstructure there that's actually pretty good so we have the auxiliaries um, have and be down in the bottom right and the nearest verbs to the verb to be are other verbs that linguists call copular verbs, ones that take adjectival complements. So as just as you can um, be annoyed, you can remain annoyed or become annoyed. Um, then up the top, we have come and go as a very close pair. And over to the bottom um, left, we then have verbs that take um, sentential complements. So he said that he was annoyed. He thinks that he's annoyed. He expects that she'll be annoyed kind of sentences. So there's this sort of very um, good meaning capturing. But the result that stunned people at the time wasn't just that you captured semantic similarity well, but that you this was revealing meaning components in space. So the most famous example was doing this for um, the gender dimension. That works for many other examples too. I'll, I'll show you one or two later. And so the idea here was that you could have a gender meaning component, which would be the vector difference between woman and man. And if you, you could then apply that to other words to do analogical reasoning. Um, so if you wanted to work out um, the correspondence, man is to woman as king is to what? Well, we could take the um, vector difference between man and woman, add it on to king, and then ask which word was nearest to that in the space, and bingo, it'll come back um, as queen. I mean, I do this live every year at the beginning of my um, class on NLP with deep learning, and you know, it is actually just stunning the percent of the time it actually just works when we try it out in different things. So that was a really interesting result. Um, but here's a result that a lot less people were aware of. Um, so a number of years earlier, um, Doug Rohde, who was a psychology student, because there's a strong thread of um, LSA work in psychology, he'd actually um, shown um, that um, if you were careful in scaling um, word co-occurrence frequencies, so not using raw frequencies, but scaling them carefully, you could get exactly the same effect um, with the SVD composition. So here's one of the examples he shows where you've got the same kind of um, linear difference between a verb and the noun for the agent of the verb. Um, at the time the word to vec paper came out, um, this paper um, only had about 50 citations. Um, but after we pointed out this connection, I guess it's gathered a, a few more now, but still a few, still three orders of magnitude, no, two orders of magnitude down um, from what word to vec has. Um, so it seemed like there wasn't necessarily magic in this sort of iterative updating procedure that was being used by word to vec. And you could do fine with word co-occurrence if you thought about how to carefully scale things. And so that was something that we worked on in 2014 with Jeffrey Pennington um, as to, can we just work with a co-occurrence matrix and get out of it good word vectors? And the suggestion was that we wanted to have um, linear meaning components in the word vector space. And the way to do that was to have those capture ratios of co-occurrence probabilities. So if we precisely chose a log by linear model, so the dot product um, was proportional to the log of the probability of co-occurrence, then that will trivially give us that vector differences correspond um, to ratios of correspondence of co-occurrence probabilities. 
So we made the model just like that. So there are a couple of extra bias terms, but this is essentially saying make the dot products the same as the log of co-occurrence probabilities. And then out the front, there's this f of x i j term. And that reflects that sort of one of the tricks that was, was being shown is you want to be careful how you scale numbers to get good results out of these systems. And so we were using um, this damp scaling. Um, so it's not dominated for very high frequency terms. And that works great. Fast training off one matrix, very scalable, produces good word vectors. And so here are some examples of the kind um, that um, we can see here. So this is a whole bunch of the gender pairs, which are pretty good at being in linear direction. Here's a different, more syntactic one. So here goes from positive comparative to superlative adjectives. Um, and so that all works great. Um, in fact, what you can find is that, you know, in terms of word similarity, actually a nicely scaled SVD just works fine. It doesn't actually really work any worse than these methods um, that were came, come up with later, but there actually is a gap. And I think the, the rest of this gap is still incompletely understood. So if you then go to these analogy tests, well, either word to Beck or glove perhaps by construction, do work better than an LSA. And if you then say, well, if you take these word vectors and use them in downstream linguistic applications, such as perhaps name entity recognition, building a system to find person, organization, location, et cetera, names and text, and it's just indisputable that modern word vectors work a lot better than L LSA. And I think it's still kind of incompletely understood why um, the SVD is fine for similarity and doesn't, at least as currently discovered how to scale at work as well for some of these other things. Um, but anyway, this big emphasis on word vectors, this was, I guess, um, friendly terrain for theorists. And there's then been a whole bunch of subsequent work that has looked into these word spaces and the property of these spaces, including work by Sanjeev Arora and others. I'm um, not going to have time to talk about any of this today, um, but that's an area that continues to be investigated. Um, what I want to go on to is, well, when we're doing natural language understanding, we want more than just words. We want to put words into sentences. And the very minimal understanding we can have of dealing with language is we at least get a sequence of words and we want to start modeling that. And the most, most basic tool to do that um, in neural land is a recurrent neural network. So to build one of those, we first for each word, get a word embedding of the kind that we've just talked about. And then we have a recurrent layer. So from a hidden state, we multiply the previous hidden state by a matrix. We multiply the word vector by a matrix. We sum the two of them and we put them through a nonlinearity and get a next hidden state. And keeping on using the same parameters, we go through the text and produce these hidden representations. And at any point, we can use this hidden state representation to do something such as predict what word should come next. We put it through a softmax, sort of like before, and we get a word distribution. Um, so this is an interesting representation I'll come back to. It starts to show already that we have something new here in this hidden state where we have uh, a new representation of a word token. So here's a representation of the word opened appearing in the context of the students. But before getting on to that, I want to show you a bit of work me and students did recently, and colleagues, I guess, um, on trying to work out why these recurrent neural networks could do so well. Um, and so this was work led by John Hewitt and Michael Hahn together, Surya Ganguly and Percy Liang. So the conundrum starts like this. Um, one of the most basic facts that we tell people in a linguistics class is that human languages have a hierarchical or recursive structure with nesting. So if you have a sentence like the man that the woman likes left, um, you have the embedded relative clause that the woman likes. So it's the woman that's doing the liking and the man that's doing the leaving. Um, if you try and make these deeper, 
in very short, simple sentences, um, you start to um, stretch human brains towards breakdown, it appears. So the man that the woman, the child knows likes left is exactly the same structure, just embedded one more time. And most human beings, if you say that to them, they can't actually process it. But, you know, interestingly, there are, you know, even though they're not exactly common, there are lots of cases of exactly the same depth in more complex sentences, and they sound completely fine when there's a little bit more um, context. So um, here is an example from a linguist. Um, the only thing that the words that can lose D have in common is apparently that they are all quite common words, and we have exactly the same triple nesting as in the example above. Or here's a spoken example from Richard Feynman's Nobel Prize address. The odds that your theory will be in fact right and that the general thing that everybody's working on will be wrong are low. Um, and we do have exactly the same triple predicates at the end of working on will be wrong are low. It's just with a few more auxiliary verbs. And so the interesting thing is humans by and large can maintain this kind of nested structure. And so we say the odds are low. So odds are plural. So you get a plural verb there, despite the fact that there are all of these intervening singular nouns, theory, thing, and everybody's, whereas conversely for the example above, the thing is, um, despite the fact that there's an intervening plural word, words. Um, and so that, when I first got interested in doing things with neural networks about 2010, that was um, the central theoretical thing I was interested in. It seemed like there weren't neural networks that really modeled this hierarchical tree structure of human languages. And so me and several students set about building tree recursive neural networks and later tree LSTMs to try and model that. Um, and you know, that was interesting for what it was worth. Um, and other people um, tried to achieve the same thing by making stack augmented recursive neural networks because you can get the same effect by adding on a stack just like classical formal languages. But although you could do this and basically get it to work, um, what the majority of other people found is that even though human languages have this structure, actually an RNN sequence model um, can do really well on predicting these agreement facts. Um, and indeed, for other things that have similar kind of context-free grammar-like structure, whether it's programming languages or LaTeX documents, you can generate them with an RNN and it works amazingly well. Um, in particular, I'll just note that usually in practice, what we actually use are networks called LSTMs, long short-term memory units, which have additional gating and a different update rule for a cell, which lets them maintain long memory better than the simple RNN that I showed. Um, but nevertheless, they are just recurrent sequence models the same. So it seemed curious that we have this um, tree-like structure, but we can do fine with just a sequence model. And so we wanted to explore that a little bit further. And so, well, what are the results on how well you should be able to do? Well, the classic theoretical result on RNNs is that RNNs can do anything, Siegelman and Sontag, 1992. Um, but that um, result was based on having unbounded precision of the floating point numbers in your neural network and an unbounded running time for your RNN. Um, and so that's not a very realistic scenario. In particular, the way we actually use RNNs and all these applications is we just have them do one step of um, computation for each input signal that we read. Um, and so the sort of ways in which you can hide a Turing machine inside an RNN if you're allowed to do unbounded um, running time don't exist then when you're sort of just doing one step per token. Um, so some more recent work by Weiss and then Merrill et al looked at the configuration of assuming you only do one um, computation step per token and assumed logarithmic precision. And so Weiss showed then that um, RNNs can't even count, which seems useful for being able to handle embedding, though actually LSTMs can because of their gating structure. Um, but then um, Merrill showed that neither of them can recognize stack requiring languages, i.e. context-free grammars. Um, so that seems bad. 
Um, but nevertheless, in practice, these models always seem to work. Um, so we wanted to sort of push things a bit further because we haven't yet seen a computer that has logarithmic precision as your um, sequence grows. So what we work with in the real world is finite precision. And in fact, neural networks, we normally for efficiency make them with very low precision, right? It's very common to actually work with floating point 16 bits um, and still one uh, once per token. So is there anything interesting you can show with that? Um, well, it seems reasonable to say that humans don't have infinite size stacks. So maybe, and we saw our human stack being blown earlier. Um, so maybe there's an interesting question of can RNNs handle bounded hierarchy? And so we started looking at these Dyke KM languages. So that's the nested parentheses language like Dyke K where you have K types of parentheses but having at most M brackets in the stack at any time. So in the examples shown, it's an example of Dyke 2.4 um, because in the middle, it gets down to depth four. Um, can we say interesting things about the generational recognition of these languages? Um, well, you know, on one hand, it seems like it's trivial because RNNs can obviously generate um, Dyke, Dyke KM languages because a Dyke KM language requires finite memory, therefore it's a regular language. And so we can know that we can, it's recognizable by a, a deterministic finite automaton and RNNs can simulate any deterministic finite automaton. But the problem in that is um, this DFA requires an exponential number of states and the results for RNNs is that they require a hidden start, hidden state size in terms of the dimensionality that's roughly the same size as the number of states of the DFA. And so therefore you need exponential memory to be able to do it with an RNN, which is again, not what we have in the real world. Um, so in particular, if you assume say a hundred thousand word vocabulary in a stack depth of three, which we saw humans could understand before, you then have to be using hidden units with a dimensionality of about 10 to the 15, which doesn't sound very plausible since normally what we do is use hidden units with a dimensionality of approximately 300 or at most a thousand. Um, and so what we, worked on showing was that you can actually show that RNNs can recognize these Dyke KM like or generate these Dyke KM languages with a much tighter bound of order M log K hidden units in their hidden state, which means actually you can do fine to do this case in a dimensionality of 300. And so how do you do that? Well, the idea of how we do this is pretty simple. So for our hidden state, if we want to be able um, to do a depth of M, we divide our hidden state up into the number of parts of the stack we get. And then we could think of encoding um, what parentheses we've seen open in the different components of this stack. And you can um, apply tricks like logarithmic encoding to um, store in a smaller number of bits um, different um, parenthesis types. Um, and well, then it seems like it should be easy because if we could then um, implement a push operation into our stack and we can implement a pop operation in our stack by matrix multiplication, we then just got a stack that we can manipulate in our RNN and all is good. But it doesn't quite work that simply because if you remember the RNN equation, there's just a single matrix that's always used that multiplies um, the hidden state. And we can't implement this kind of trivial pushing and popping um, in with a single matrix. But there's a little trick that we can do, which is we can actually um, maintain two copies of the stack, um, one of which will always be empty. And then we can, with our matrix, multiplication, always read from both and always write to both so that we're going to simultaneously attempt pushing and popping of the two halves, one of which will be empty. Um, so then we've got candidates where from one position we could either have pushed or popped, and then we want to work out which one to keep. 
And well, we can work out which one to keep by then using the other part of our RNN equation. Since we're getting an input and we can see whether the input is or isn't closing something on our, on our stack. And so with the U matrix multiplied by the input, we can then add on a term that will either make um, the elements of the hidden state a very large negative number or um, make no change to it. And so then once we put it through the nonlinearity, we can return the very large negative number into zero and we are left maintaining um, our stack. And so that gives us a very compact construction where we can um, generate that KM using a low dimensionality um, RNN. Um, and so the contrast you see is it previously been shown um, that RNNs couldn't in practice um, learn Dyke K, but we show empirically that Dyke KM is learnable by an RNN of the size our theory suggests where we don't really know what it's doing, but you could at least see that as consistent with the kind of results that we have for stack size. Um, so I think there might be something interesting here. The Chomsky hierarchy places all finite memory languages in the same class, but you know, neural networks and human brains are finite. So it seems like really we need some finer grain theoretical tools like memory efficiency to have interesting models of what things can and can't be processed with the kind of models we build. Um, but I then wanna um, leap ahead. Um, gee, about how long do I have left? About 10 minutes. Okay, leave ahead and say a bit about um, what's been happening most recently in the NLP world. Um, so starting in 2018, people started taking huge corpora of text and building really, really huge um, neural networks. The first generation of those like Elmo and Olmfit were done as very large um, recurrent neural networks. But shortly after that, the transformer architecture was developed and it had much um, more favorable parallelizability and all of the um, big, huge models whose names you probably heard like GPT-2 and 3 and BERT um, are then instances of these transformer models. And these transformer models, um, just as language generation devices, produced a new ability um, to produce much higher quality text. Um, so here's an example. So if we give it a context that the human rights to prompt that a train carriage containing controlled nuclear materials was stolen in Cincinnati today, um, generating on from that context, it says the incident occurred on the downtown train line which runs from Covington National Stations, et cetera. And well, even simpler models could basically produce locally coherent text. But what's stunning about these models is that they, it can produce paragraphs of coherent text that genuinely tell a story and that will correctly and interestingly pick out context, right? And not just those associations like the US Department of Energy is responsible for nuclear materials. Since there's mention of something being stolen, there's then references to a thief and um, bringing in um, um, stolen material. Um, Cincinnati goes to Ohio, um, you know, that it's all just extremely, extremely good text production. Um, so I can't really say in detail how these models work, but the central part of them is this attention operation where from a hidden state, you're projecting three matrices, a query key and a value, and then you're doing a dot product based um, calculation between a query at each position and the key everywhere else to work out a kind of a similarity score. And you use that to produce a weighting for a weighted average of the values at each position to produce a new representation above a word. And you're repeating this many times upwards, which gives the kind of an easy parallelizability while the models incorporate sentence context. Um, and so the standard way to use this is you train a really humongous transformer-based language model predicting words as before, and then you can fine tune it on a little bit of supervised hand-labeled data to do other tasks like named entity recognition or something like question answering. 
So to show you just one example of the success of these models, um, a popular task has been question answering. So there's like middle school reading comprehension. So there's a passage and you ask a question like which team won Super Bowl 50? And you can hopefully read the passage and decide it's the Denver Broncos. Um, so this was a model, this was a problem where in the sort of 2015, 16, 17 period, um, it was shown that um, neural models based on recurrent neural networks um, could do this much more successfully than conventional statistical machine learning systems. So rather than getting about 51%, they were getting accuracies in the high 70s. Um, but once these large pre-trained language models um, came along, they were just um, much better again. So if you skip to two years later, you couldn't be near the top of the leaderboard unless you were using BERT. And then these models were getting scores in the high 80s. Um, and um, with another couple of years, the numbers are higher still. In fact, they're higher than the scores returned by humans, at least if um, people paid a few bucks on Mechanical Turk is your idea of human performance. Um, so these models were really interesting. And so something um, that I've been interested in is how can these models be so good? And again, you're sort of doing these sort of fairly mechanical seeming computations of similarities and weighted averages and so on. But somehow these models seem to end up knowing so much about human language. Um, and so together with various students, Kevin, John and Urvashi, we started trying to look more into what you could do with these transformer models. And well, the simplest thing is everywhere where you've got an attention head, you can say, well, for each word, what other word in the context is it looking at? Um, and that can tell you some kind of inf useful information. So we looked at that. And well, what you find is low down in the transformer, a lot of the attention heads do kind of simple things. So they'll be, they'll be bag of words heads, which just essentially average everything around them. But you know, that's not crazy to do. And there are attention heads that look at the word to the left or look at the word to the right. And again, you know, that's a, not a crazy first strategy because really those are the single most useful words. Um, but as you sort of head up into deeper levels of the transformer, there are attention heads that specialize in much more linguistic things. So we might wonder if some of the um, attention heads do syntactic things. And well, one way of thinking about syntax is dependency syntax, where you look at um, words that are the arguments or dependence of other words. So I is the subject of went, store is the object of the preposition to. Can you see these kind of grammatical relations appearing um, in the attention heads? And the answer is, yeah, you can. So at the eighth level of this BERT transformer, the 10th attention head essentially has noun pre-modifiers pointing, uh, sorry, uh, an object noun and its pre-modifiers pointing back to its verb. So um, Payne Weber considered an even harder cell. All of an even and harder cell point back to considered. Um, recommending specific stocks, specific stocks are pointing back towards recommending. Um, the 11th head at the same layer then has um, articles and adjectival pre-modifiers of a noun pointing to the noun, the complicated language, that uncomplicated point of language um, in the huge new law, um, the huge new, and indeed in, um, then point to law. Um, there's another one head that is basically a co-reference head and tells you about things like pronominal and nominal co-reference. Um, so with Kim today, as she got some expert opinions on the damage to her home, um, that this head that at her, it's pointing to her, she, and more weakly Kim, for she, it's pointing to her, she, and Kim. Um, so again, co-reference relationships back even for nominal cases. So joining peace talks between Israel and the Palestinians, the negotiations are that negotiations and talks are both pointing to each other. So that's kind of cool, but we're interested in doing a bit more than that. So we wanted to know if the hidden state representations really had syntax hidden inside them. And so can we find the kind of syntax trees linguists look at 
inside the vector representations that the model is using. And that initially looks kind of difficult because we've got these big word vectors versus a syntax tree, but we can put the two in the space that we can do something with by thinking about distance metrics, because trees have distance metrics on them, which is just the path distance between the words, and our vector spaces have distance metrics. And so we can start off with our contextualized word vectors that BERT computes at the top of the transformer representation. And then obviously this represents a lot of sentence meaning as well. So our hypothesis is only part of the vectors are going to represent syntactic structure. So what we'd like to find is a projection matrix, linear transformation, that will get out of the complete vector, the part that tells us about syntactic structure. Um, and then if we look in that part, we can then work out um, words that are arguments of each other by looking at ones that are close in this space. And in particular, we can just ask for a minimum spanning tree in this space, and that will recover a syntactic parse tree in terms of grammatical relations. And so the question is, is there such a projection matrix? Can we find one matrix B with which we can project the representations that are calculated for each word um, in a transformer in such a way that if we make that projection, um, we actually then have something that can project to syntax um, so that if we then form a minimal spanning tree, it gives us the parse structure of a sentence in terms of grammatical relations. And the surprising thing is that to a high degree we can. So we can't for things like just word embeddings, um, but for these modern transformer representations like BERT and some of the more recent ones are even better, We've gone to the point where there is a projection matrix where just simply taking this minimal spanning tree gives us a pretty good parse of a sentence. Not the very best that we can get with supervised parsers, but really a pretty good one. Um, so here's an example sort of where the minimum spanning tree almost exactly produce, reproduces the human given parse. There's one error towards the end if you look carefully. Um, and what we find is that the syntax space is relatively low dimensional. It seems like having a 64D projection is enough to get out all the syntax, which is kind of what you'd think, because really most of the representations are surely encoding the meaning of sentences. Um, so that's kind of interesting. So effectively now that these new models are just incredibly good at doing this unsupervised or self-supervised learning by doing this language modeling word prediction task, they become so good at it that they're not just sort of statistical association finders, that they've actually able to discover that knowing about the linguistic sentence structures of different sentences allows them to do the prediction task better because they can do things like predict agreement correctly for those kind of nested examples I showed. Um, and so we actually have sort of linguistic syntax being discovered by BERT style models. And I think that's actually a quite um, stunning result in our now ability to do unsupervised learning of what we used to think that we had to hand label um, sentences for to get progress. Um, I showed in this end bit of work that you can get out these representations. Um, I think it's still um, incredibly ununderstood how this happens. I mean, you can sort of wave your hands and say, well, it'll be useful to the model if it um, gets this structure out, but it still seems like it's kind of magic um, how this structure doesn't emerge in the, in the representations from a transformer. So I think there's still a ton of work to do on how to better theoretically understand these models. And hopefully everyone else presenting in this workshop is doing a really productive job at solving that problem. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Uh, uh, we have time for maybe one or two questions. So uh, if you have any questions, please feel free to unmute yourself and go ahead and ask. So maybe I can get started. So I mean, it does seem really uh, surprising and uh, 
fascinating that there is like this nice low dimensional projection that uh, th from which you can get a tree structure out of it. I was just wondering if you have any intuition for why uh, it should be a linear subspace that somehow picks out the tree structure. Why, why there should be a linear subspace in the first place that picks out a tree structure? Uh, or yeah, I mean, is this something expected or is this uh, from what I mean, we see? You know, for, for us, it was just something um, neat that we found that we could get this to work well. Um, and um, so I don't um, feel like I have a very good understanding of this, but I mean, there is actually sort of a minor little trick here, which it sort of said on the slides, but I didn't mention, um, is that we're precisely working um, with the connection um, between tree distance and squared vector distance. Mm -hmm. And um, this actually doesn't work as well if you try and connect yeah. it between um, Euclidean. tree distance and Euclidean distance. And then there was actually then a subsequent um, paper um, by a group of people at Google. And, you know, I don't think they sort of fully um, explained everything either, um, but they did actually have a nice observation about trying to how trying to work with Euclidean distance actually doesn't work um, because of the nature of Euclidean spaces where it at least can work um, with squared um, distance. I see. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Uh, are there any other questions of okay. Chris? Okay, maybe uh, we can, uh, yeah, I mean, let's thank the speaker again and uh, thank you, Chris, for the great talk. Uh, so, 